So the most simplest method that we have to measure heat pulse velocity in plant stems, it's called the, the Tmax method. The method was developed by Cohen et al. back in 1981, and it's a two-probe configuration where we have a heater probe and then a downstream temperature probe. In this example, the spacing between the heater probe and the temperature probe is 6 millimetres, but that spacing can be other spacings, for example, 10 millimetres or 15 millimetres. But generally, we, we do stick with the 6 millimetre spacing uh, for just this two probe configuration. So, with the Tmax method, what we are interested in measuring, or what we are interested in knowing, is how long does it take for the maximum rise in temperature following a heat pulse? So in this graph here, again, we have our delta T on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And at the origin where we fire the heat pulse into the plant material, we see that the temperature rises rapidly and it reaches a maximum point at some time. So with the Tmax method, we want to know what is this time after the heat pulse that it reaches a maximum. And in this case, it is 60 seconds after the heat pulse. So the Tmax equation is given here up the top. And the first thing to think about in this equation is uh, just going back to your high school physics. So we have velocity equals distance divided by time. And this part of the equation here, this is our thermal properties in the equation. So Vh is your velocity. X is the distance between the heater and the temperature probe. So in our case, it is six millimeters or 0.6 centimeters. Uh, Tm is the time to your maximum rise in temperature, and K is your thermal diffusivity. So it's a fairly simple equation to measure with the Tmax method. So here are a couple of examples uh, using the Tmax method. Uh, so our blue line here is when velocity equals 60 centimetres per hour, and the time to maximum temperature rise, which is that point there, was 45 seconds. Then when velocity equals 30 centimetres per hour, or the red curve on your graph here, the time to maximum temperature rise was 68 seconds. So we know what the distance is between our heater and our temperature probe. So we know what X is. We can measure the time it takes to the temperature rise, and we can also measure the thermal diffusivity. So we can measure all these parameters, put it into this equation, and then we can know what heat pulse velocity is. The next method to consider is called the compensation heat pulse method. And this one is uh, slightly more complex to the Tmax method because it consists of a three probe configuration. So we still have our heater probe and our downstream temperature probe, but now we have a second temperature probe, which is upstream to the heater probe. So the spacing is also a little bit different to what we saw with the Tmax method. So the spacing between the heater and the temperature, the downstream temperature probe, is 10 millimeters, and the spacing between the heater and the upstream temperature probe is five millimeters. So again, you don't strictly have to use these spacings. You can use something different, but what is important with the compensation heat pulse method is that the spacings are not equal. So you don't wanna have equal spacings between the temperature probes. They need to be unequal. So the method was first uh, proposed by Kloss back in 1958 but it was really uh, developed further by Swanson in 1962 and in further publications. And it's one of the most widely used heat pulse velocity methods. So with the compensation heat pulse method, what we are interested to know with this method is when the two temperature curves intersect or, or when the temperatures become equal. So looking at our um, condu conduction and convection graph here, we have the red curve, which is our upstream temperature probe, and the blue curve is our downstream temperature probe. So the upstream temperature probe has a rapid rise in temperature, reaches a maximum, and then there's a decay, whereas the downstream has a slower rise in temperature and reaches a maximum and a slower decay. And this intersection here, we give the term T0. So the reason why the upstream um, temperature probe increases more rapidly, simply because it is at a closer distance to the heater than what the downstream temperature probe is. Uh, so the velocity, the heat's not necessarily traveling quicker. It's just at a, a closer location um, in terms of the upstream to the um, heater probe.
So the heat pulse, sorry, the compensation heat pulse equation, it's a little bit more simple than the T max method. But again, just going back to our high school physics, we have our velocity equals distance divided by time. So distance in this case is calculated as the sum of XD plus XU. So XD is the distance to the downstream temperature probe and XU is the distance to the upstream temperature probe. And we give XU a negative number. And as we saw in a previous slide, T0 is the time it takes for our downstream and upstream temperature curves to intersect. And we can put those values into this equation to get heat velocity. So one thing that you would note from the compensation heat pulse method equation is that there's no term for the thermal properties. So we said heat pulse velocity methods basically measure um, distance divided by time with some kind of thermal properties in there. So with the three probe configuration that we have here, the upstream temperature probe is actually um, the one that's recording our thermal properties in the stem. So we say that the upstream temperature probe compensates or removes conductance from this equation. And so that's why we don't need to have an explicit term in the equation to measure the thermal diffusivity or thermal conductance. So the upstream temperature probe compensates or removes um, or compensates for the heat or the conductance or the way heat diffuses through the stem. The next method that we can consider, it's called the slow rates of flow or the heat ratio method. And like the compensation heat pulse method, it is based on a three probe configuration. So again, we have a central heater probe and a downstream and an upstream temperature probe. But in this case, the distances between the temperature probes are the same. So we, we call that an equidistance. In our example here, they're at a six millimeter spacing. So this configuration was initially proposed by Marshall back in 1958, and he called it the slow rates of flow method. Hogg et al. in 1997 and a few other papers developed the method further, and it was also developed by Burgess in 1998 and 2001, and Burgess et al. in 1998 called it the heat ratio method, and that's the name that sort of stuck with this um, technique, so we usually refer to it as the heat ratio method um, in this day. So what we are interested to measure with the slow rates of flow or the heat ratio method is the ratio of the downstream to the upstream temperature, 60 seconds following a heat pulse. So going back to our conductance and convection graph, uh, we have the heat pulse at the origin and the upstream and the downstream curves are shown here on the graph. So 60 seconds after the heat pulse, we take a measurement and we take the ratio of the downstream to the upstream probes. And we can put that into our slow rates of flow or heat ratio method equation. So even though in theory we only need to take one measurement point at 60 seconds after the heat pulse, in practice we like to take more than one measurement point because our sensors and our data loggers have a bit of electronic noise in them. So we take an average of, of several readings to try and minimize or eliminate this noise. So you see some papers, they take an average between 60 and 100 seconds. Um, so that's within this window here. And then take the ratio of the downstream to the upstream temperature over the average of those readings there. You don't have to do 60 to 100 seconds. You can, other windows are possible. For example, 60 to 80 seconds or 70 to 90 seconds. Uh, but it's always a good idea to get more than one temperature reading just to minimize the variation or any noise that may be in your system. So once we've taken our temperature measurement points in the downstream and the upstream temperature probes, we can then use the equation uh, that was developed by Marshall back in 1958. So here's the equation here, and you can see this as equation 15 in Marshall 1958. So this equation, you have thermal diffusivity divided by the distance between the heater probe and the temperature probe, uh, multiplied by the log of the ratio of the downstream to the upstream temperature. So it's a fairly simple equation and it was initially developed by Marshall back in 1958. The Marshall-Hogg heat ratio method is slightly different to the Marshall-Burgess heat ratio method 
in that we're now interested in knowing what the sap velocity is. So in this equation, we have the thermal conductance, which is this capital K, divided by the specific heat of sap, which is this CW term. And we've still got distance uh, multiplied by the log of the downstream to the upstream temperature rise. So we have uh, two different ways that we can measure heat pulse velocity with the heat ratio method. So the first one I'm calling the Marshall Burgess heat ratio method, and the second one the Marshall Hogg heat ratio method. We give them these names because Marshall developed both the equations back in 1958, but Burgess developed one equation um, on the one hand and Hogg developed the other equation on the other hand. So the Marshall Burgess HRM measures heat velocity whereas the Marshall-Hogg measures sap velocity. The Marshall-Burgess measures thermal diffusivity, whereas the Marshall-Hogg measures thermal conductivity. With the Marshall-Burgess method, you do need to have a wound correction, but with the Marshall-Hogg, there is no wound correction. The calibration for the Marshall-Burgess is quite complex and it's a polynomial equation, whereas the Marshall-Hogg is a simple and linear calibration. The Marshall Burgess is ideal for your larger plants, uh, for example, your trees growing out in a forest, but your Marshall Hog is more ideal for your smaller plants, um, say your herbaceous plants or a sapling that might be growing in a glass house. In the Marshall Hog, you can also get the simultaneous measurement of stem water content.